In the last episode, Tokugawa Ieyasu secured his victory on the field at Sekigahara, as the Western Army disintegrated, forcing many to flee, while others such as Konishi Yukinaga and Ishida Mitsunari himself were captured and later executed. It was clear that Japan was on the precipice of a new age, one ruled by the Tokugawa. Now, as Ieyasu has cemented his grip over the nation, he will be named the military ruler of all Japan, resurrecting and claiming the coveted and absolute title of Shogun. By 1603, Japan had entered into a new era of peace, one which the country really had not seen in centuries. As now, from coast to coast, all across the land, one name had become the supreme and unquestionable power, Tokugawa. With Ieyasu's victory at the Battle of Sekigahara, the situation was made abundantly clear for all the daimyo in Japan. The Tokugawa were the new face of the government and you could either fall in line under them or face the consequences. Indeed, after the defeat of the Western Army, it was quickly understood who was on the right side of the Tokugawa fence and who was not, as all those who had previously dared to stand against Ieyasu now had to be dealt with in some way. Like Toyotomi Hideyoshi before him, Ieyasu now possessed the capability to reshape the nation in a manner that preserved peace and stability. However, while Hideyoshi had failed to secure a future for his own family and regime while also dooming his own reputation with his invasion of Korea, Ieyasu was able to use Hideyoshi's example as a means to see how to craft his own regime, something that gets overlooked being that the very establishment of Tokugawa Ieyasu's military government, which capital was in his power base of Edo, had been built atop the very foundations that Hideyoshi had laid during his time in office. By extent, Ieyasu's government was the furthering of Hideyoshi's, yet with the foresight to know how to improve and build upon it, in ways Hideyoshi was not able to ever see or know how to properly do. There was one thing that Hideyoshi did understand, however, and that was that he needed to find a way to preserve peace at home, peace across Japan, and keep the many daimyo in line with their ambitions tamed. And while Hideyoshi's largest answer to this was to invade the Asian mainland, turning the focus away from Japan itself and giving the daimyo a new target to sink their teeth into, Ieyasu had foreseen another route, one of supreme legitimacy. As we have talked about from time to time before, Ieyasu was someone who definitely held a great ambition within him, one that he had acted upon several times throughout his life from breaking away from the Imagawa to restore his own family in Mikawa, to siding against Hideyoshi at the Battle of Komaki Nagakute, and to importantly how he had established a connection that linked his family to the Minamoto. And this connection to the Minamoto, although a flimsy claim, was still one that had been granted imperial recognition, so as far as anyone was concerned, it was legitimate. This by far is the clearest early indicator of perhaps his true dream, to one day take up the mantle of Shogun, military leader of all Japan. And with the previous claimant of that title, Ashikaga Yoshiaki having recently died in 1597, there was really not anyone alive who could contest him. Prior to this time, this was never something Ieyasu had the opportunity to press, being that before this point he had not been the dominant power in the land. But now, with his rule unquestionable, he could. And he could do so without anyone calling his claims to it false. Not only was he the undisputed military power across all Japan, who now had the ability to do as he pleased no matter who said anything, but he had that Minamoto lineage that gave him a special distinction, as each shogunate before had been helmed by those descended from the Minamoto bloodline. Now, I need to say that there is speculation today if there really was this necessity to be of the Minamoto family in order to take up the title of Shogun, as there are apparently no historic writings to confirm this, 
In fact, one of the Japanese translated sources I was able to find on this says that it may have been a customary thing, which then means that it was perhaps not necessarily an official rule. What I at least believe is that it came down to a matter of legitimacy to hold the title of Shogun. This means that although perhaps one did not officially need to be of the Minamoto family to become Shogun, being descended from the Minamoto was seen as perhaps the proper and most legitimate way to obtain and hold the title. This is just my own potential theory, because plenty of Western Japanese history books to this day claim there needed to be this distinction of Minamoto roots in order to become Shogun. There is another theory that suggests that this idea of having to be descended from the Minamoto originated in the Edo period, which then gets into a completely different gray area of what is real and what is not. Whatever the case, Ieyasu possessed all he needed in order to petition Emperor Goyoze for the title of Sei Taishogun, the official military ruler of the nation, lord of all the daimyo and their samurai clans. Throughout a series of proclamations, Ieyasu was made the new shogun, officially by March 27th of 1603, transforming his military government into a shogunate. This was the birth of the Edo Bakufu. This was the birth of the Edo period. Ieyasu now held authority over the entire country in ways his predecessors never really did. Of course, this new shogunate had to not only function as a successor to that of Toyotomi Hideyoshi's regime, but also a successor to that of the previous two shogunates, which had both enjoyed centuries of rule, yet in the end came crashing down under the weight of their own deficiencies. How could Ieyasu's Edo Bakufu succeed where the previous two had failed? The one thing that was in Ieyasu's favor was that he had the hindsight to know how to best establish a strong military government and maintain it from the get-go. Obviously, its future survival would be up to generations to come. One of the main faults of the first shogunate, the Kamakura shogunate, was its positioning, having a somewhat weak grip over the imperial capital Kyoto. Like Ieyasu's power base in Edo, the Kamakura shogunate too was located in the Kanto region, far from the emperor's seat of power. This in turn was one of the more significant reasons why the Kamakura shogunate was unable to maintain their grip over the emperor and his court in Kyoto, halfway across the country. The Ashikaga shogunate, which followed it, sought to remedy this fault by setting itself up literally within the capital, having a strong presence throughout the city and a stranglehold on imperial politics. Yet having their capital in Kyoto as well caused their own authority across the country to suffer over time in addition to the fact that their own shoguns became lost in the mire of Kyoto culture. To this end, Ieyasu would decide to keep his military capital in Edo, which in turn would really become the true capital of the country, while in Kyoto he would keep a heavy grip around the emperor. This would be largely successful by placing loyal families around the city, and most importantly, through the prominence of Nijo Castle, a mighty and influential shogunate stronghold in Kyoto, which was to be the main hub of any interaction with the emperor and his court. Everything had to funnel up through Nijo. This then allowed Ieyasu to keep his own shogunal capital separate, while also essentially ruling the politics of the imperial capital but to ensure that his authority was felt across the entire country, from the north to the south, to the islands of Shikoku and Kyushu. He also had to skillfully arrange an intricate web of powerful allies to be beacons of shogunal influence. After his full rise to power, he had the means with which to punish those who he may have viewed to be his biggest rivals, while propping up his biggest supporters. Those who had stood against Ieyasu at Sekigahara were to be branded as Tozama Daimyo, outsiders whose own territory would see reduction. They would also be barred from earning positions within the new Bakufu, as well as under constant guard by larger and stronger Tokugawa loyalists like that of the Fudai, inner lords who often would be positioned near the Tozama. There was a general reshuffling of the nation, as Ieyasu could freely move lords around, granting mighty positions to those who were trustworthy and diminishing those who were viewed as threats. However, simply moving families around would not be enough to keep them all in line. Further rules had to be established to firmly dominate everyone. Even those who were viewed in a positive light by the shogunate would too have hefty restrictions placed upon them. These restrictions fell in the way of things such as castle ownership, ensuring that families remained with only one stronghold and must receive government approval to either add on to it or repair damages. 
lords being required to spend much of their time throughout the year in Edo instead of in their home province, and domains now being heavily defined by their rice production, measured in units of koku, with more wealthy domains producing larger quantities. The most trusted lords were to receive lands with the highest yield, while others were obviously to receive less. This brings us to how Ieyasu would redistribute lands to his loyal allies who aided him in his victory over the Western Army throughout the Sekigahara War. We see that Inaomasa would be awarded territory in Omi Province that had previously belonged to Ishida Mitsunari. Another suspected reason for this was due to the Yi family's ardent support for the Emperor, as having them close to Kyoto could safeguard the Imperial City during times of emergency. Unfortunately, Naomasa would come to die in 1602 from what is largely believed to be the bullet wound he sustained at the Battle of Sekigahara, having been hit by a Shimazu gunner. This led to his son Naokatsu eventually succeeding him as head of the family. Fukushima Masanori would receive territory in Aki province and throughout other areas in the west, taking up lands that had previously long been held by the Mori, who were now contained within Suo and Nagato. Hosokawa Taraoki would receive sizable land in Buzen. The great turncoat Kobayakawa Hideaki would be transferred to Bizen, but would later die in 1602, while Kuroda Nagamasa would receive influence over much of Hideaki's previous domain in Chikuzen. Kato Kiyomasa would receive the former territories of his now dead rival, Konishi Yukinaga, helping to expand his domain in Higo. And Toro Takatora would in time receive prominent holdings in Ise and Iga. These moves ensured that Ieyasu's loyal allies who had won him his great victory remained supportive of him. It should be remembered that some of those who had taken the side of the Tokugawa at Sekigahara were not completely loyal to Ieyasu, but instead chose to support him rather than that of Ishida Mitsunari. Such was the case for prominent figures like that of Kato Kiyomasa, who was said to have remained staunchly loyal to the Toyotomi despite joining the Eastern faction. This of course then begs the question, what was Ieyasu about to do with Toyotomi Hideyori? the young son and heir of Hideyoshi, who had been previously destined to one day rule the country. Now, with Ieyasu having usurped power away from the Toyotomi, this was to be an extremely delicate subject. Immediately after his victory at Sekigahara, Ieyasu did not dare put Hideyori to death, as he was aware not only how that would make him look, but also would likely turn many of his supporters against him. Still, even three years later and after being named the new Shogun, he had to continually treat the situation very carefully. He knew he had to box the Toyotomi in, and ideally, they may peacefully in time fall in line under his new Tokugawa regime. In fact, Ieyasu had even made moves to strengthen his relationship with Hideyori, marrying his granddaughter, Sinhime, also the daughter of Tokugawa Hidetara, to Hideyori in 1603, when both her and Hideyori were still practically children. Additionally, Ieyasu allowed Hideyori to remain in his prominent position at Osaka, yet he had eroded away at Hideyori's actual power base by stripping him of some territory and simply granting Hideyori roughly the position of that of a daimyo. With Hideyori still alive and well in Osaka and under the Tokugawa gaze, Ieyasu hoped it might be enough to stem the tide of anyone who wished to go and potentially side with Hideyori against Ieyasu one day. This number was also dangerous, because not only would it include staunch Toyotomi loyalists, but also attract those who were defeated at Sekigahara, and even many more ronin who were now in need of new employment. The one thing Ieyasu did have on his side was time. As the longer Ieyasu's regime stayed in control of the country, the more concrete it was. Hopefully, under many years of a strong shogunate, the many samurai clans of Japan would bear witness to what true stability and security looked like, and would be far less inclined to side with the would-be head of the previous toppled regime. Unfortunately for Ieyasu, although Hideyori seemed at least cooperative under the new Bakufu, people around Hideyori were certainly not. In particular, one figure who continued to be a thorn in Ieyasu's side was that of Yorodono, the mother of Hideyori. Yorodono was the prominent daughter of Oichi, thus making her Oda Nobunaga's niece. She had been a concubine to Toyotomi Hideyoshi and was blessed to give him a proper heir in that of Hideyori. 
Immediately after Ieyasu's rise to power, following the battle of Sekigahara, we can see her unhappiness with the usurping of her son. And in the years to come, her meddling and influence she had over Hideyori would grow more and more prominent, as she would continue to cause tension between the Tokugawa and Toyotomi. As for Ieyasu, his time as shogun would not be long. A mere two years after obtaining the title, in 1605, he would actually decide to relinquish it to his son Hidetada, who would become the second shogun of the Edo Bakufu. If we remember back, Tokugawa Hidetada had actually been the son who had severely messed up during the Sekigahara campaign, having launched a failed assault on the Sanada clan's Ueda castle that resulted in him being late for the Battle of Sekigahara, a blunder that may have potentially cost his father victory on the field. I am sure Ieyasu still had some reservations about naming Hidetada the new shogun, but being that Ieyasu was still alive and well, he had the opportunity to ensure things remained on the right path. Additionally, he had also arranged the family to ensure that no matter what, a stable line of succession was guaranteed. In a means to never suffer from the same woes of succession that Toyotomi Hideyoshi had, Ieyasu made it clear what the Tokugawa family was to become. Having so many sons, he was able to establish multiple branches of the Tokugawa family, while others were to go back to using the previous family name of Matsudaira. In essence, he created a path for many could-be heirs in the event of a childless shogun. Now, yes, this could be seen as a potential issue which could give rise to infighting. However, there was one more factor that would come into play, starting with Ieyasu and continuing throughout the rule of the Tokugawa shogunate. This getting back to the idea of retiring early. Through this, Ieyasu and future shoguns after him would take up the practice of naming an heir and retiring long before their deaths and while they still had all of their faculties. They would go on to maintain strong influence over the country, but now in a much more secure position, as their heir had already taken power. This type of naming an heir and retiring while still alive was actually a common thing throughout Japanese history, and particularly we see it done quite often during the Sengoku Jidai. So this practice was nothing new, and in turn went to ensure stability within the shogunate itself. Now, Ieyasu was to be considered an Ogosho, a retired shogun. In actuality though, he still held most of the power in the shogunate, yet he would go on to relocate from the shogunate capital of Edo to Sanpu a place he had spent much time as a child when he was a hostage of the Imagawa. After being named Shogun and now being retired, it was certainly a whirlwind of events that Ieyasu was now able to finally put to rest. He had long wished for this victory, and the country was now firmly in the hands of his family. Decades earlier, I am sure he would have never suspected that he would have been able to secure this future, at least with his head still attached, yet despite every obstacle, he had come out on top, succeeding where Hideyoshi had left off and ensuring a stable future where Hideyoshi could not. Ieyasu had at last brought Japan into a new era. And if anything, the only matter that still perhaps worried his mind was what was to come of the Toyotomi. So, what can we learn? By 1603, Tokugawa Ieyasu, after establishing his strong military government in Edo, was able to cement his rule by being named the new shogun, military ruler of all Japan. With this legitimacy and authority, he now possessed the total means to reforge the nation into a strong, stable, and secure society, punishing those who had previously stood against him and propping up those who had loyally aided him. However, his time as shogun would be brief, as he would relinquish leadership over to his son Hidetada in 1605, thus ensuring a proper line of succession. But to say that Ieyasu's troubles were completely over would be untrue, as still the question remained of what was to be the future for Toyotomi Hideyori, the heir to Japan's previous regime. In the next episode, the Edo period gets underway as Ieyasu continues to try to rein in Hideyori, yet things will not be so simple, and he will have to be wary of those who may be all too eager to support the Toyotomi once more. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.